awesome awesome so i get now we get started we have a very heavy program and allow me to just share the program uh, and then we can all get started. So first of all, thank you very much for creating time to uh, come and learn. It's continuous development. Um, if Irene is here, we are going to give her a chance to open the session for us. I didn't come here. If she's in, we'll give her a chance. But before then, just to take you through the program, our first speaker will be Mr. Lawrence Murori, who is the CEO for NCIA. And is going to be taking us through embedding ADR, Authentic Dispute Resolution Qualification, for human resource management professionals and then we got we're gonna listen to miss jacqueline Ayawahenya, who is a managing partner for um law firm and she's going to be talking to us about the solving corporate governance dispute room again adr alternative dispute resolution and then our third speaker will be miss gladys who is a mediator and will be talking to us about mediation of workplace and labor leader disputes so a very 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 big program i'm looking forward to learning and therefore uh miss Irene, we will start now and we'll finish at one with the a q and a so keep all your questions coming uh if you look at the zoom down there you'll see a place that you're having um q and a or you can even put on the chat just put your questions as we continue for each and every speaker and then at the end we'll have a session whereby we are going to give this, each speaker a chance to uh, to ask to answer any questions that you could be having and also just interact um before we can wind up on this uh, particular very important session erin are you in no, Jane, Irene is engaged in another Irene event. is not in. Oh, please, that, yeah, okay. she'll join us later. Please, thank you. That's okay. Then in that case, uh, we are just going to go straight to the um, uh, to the session. And our first speaker, like I said, is um, is um, Murori. Lawrence Murori. Uh, Mur Lawrence Karibu Sana. Let me just introduce you and then you take it away from there. So Lawrence Murori Ngugi is a registrar. Let me just um is the registrar of board secretary at the nairobi center for international arbitration yes nairobi center for international arbitration as ceo he leads the secretariat of the center he is also an arbitrator and accredited mediator member of the international council of commercial arbitration member of the kenya representatives today um something very long that you'll be telling us um which is a council that is involved in discussions which culminated in the convention of transparency in investor state arbitration in the working group um, on dispute resolution, among us other appointments. So he's going to be talking to us about how we can have arbitration as part of a qualification that HRP can actually have. Um, so tell us more about how to become an arbitrator and also take away in terms of how we can actually get qualified as HR. Lawrence, the space is yours. Um, thank you, Jane, for your kind introduction. Uh, good morning to all. Uh, in case you're joining us in a different time zone, uh, good that time zone to, to you as we join. As Jane has mentioned, um, uh, we come from the Nairobi Center for International Arbitration. I will speak uh, briefly about what that means um, and then uh, get to the subject of the day, which is embedding competence in alternative dispute resolution for human resource uh, professionals. Um, Jane has asked, um, what does the Nairobi Center for International Arbitration uh, entail? What does it mean? So Nairobi Center for International Arbitration uh, is uh, established by an act of parliament, uh, Act Number 26 of 2013, primarily as a, an alternative dispute resolution services provider. I will come to that, uh, what that means. Um, of course, you see the name there, Nairobi. It, this means it is located in Nairobi, um, international, uh, meaning it handles disputes across borders. It handles domestic as well as cross-border international uh, disputes. Uh, we will get into the subject uh, shortly. We also do offer case administration services. Uh, that means <clears throat> from the point of time, uh, parties who are in disagreement have a dispute refer uh, that dispute to us. Uh, we register the dispute, we manage the process, we appoint um, arbitrators, you've just been mentioned to arbitrators, mediators, uh, and other dispute resolution service providers. Uh, they, they get to facilitate the process up to the point when the outcome is rendered. Um, and, and, those, and then also then we handle the uh, auxiliary services, if it is uh, stenography, uh, if it is um, 
uh, secretarial services and eventually handing over the uh, award for in the case of arbitration to the parties. We also do training in ADR for skills development and enhancement, uh, capacity building and awareness creation around uh, alternative dispute resolution. And then also we do offer a hearing facility or an ADR facility. Uh, this is custom made uh, to offer uh, services of um, a hearing uh, when parties um, require space where they can conduct a mediation, conduct an arbitration, conciliation or adjudication. We are located at the cooperative bank house um, in Nairobi at the Hell Selassie. So just to give an idea as to what the subject of today is, you probably will have heard the term alternative dispute resolution. And I was uh, split it into three words, alternative, uh, meaning it has been offered as often it has been referred to as a substitute to something else. Um, in most places, this alternative is a route other than uh, taking disputes to court. So we ordinarily are used to the phrase, let us meet in court. The alternative here stands for uh, handling disputes otherwise than going to court. A dispute, of course, a difference in opinion, uh, a difference uh, in terms of views of rights of people, obligations, a disagreement uh, of whatever nature, and of course, because of the uh, labor relations that are involved in this uh, webinar, um, a, a, a difference of opinion um, or uh, rights and obligations, maybe between an employer and an employee, an employee and another employee. And then resolution, uh, which could stand for uh, either the settlement, uh, management, uh, or other form of uh, resolution coming to an agreement that uh, in some ways the parties can uh, live with. So that is what alternative dispute resolution in general is. My, my colleagues, I'm sure, will go deeper into the subject. In, the, in Kenya, uh, we are privileged to have a specific pro uh, provision within the constitution, uh, which we say has anchored alternative dispute resolution as part of the justice uh, delivery system. So uh, Article 159.2, it enjoins the judiciary uh, well exercising judicial authority when a judge is listening to a case, uh, courts, tribunals, to be guided by uh, these principles here. Uh, C, alternative forms of dispute resolution, including reconciliation, mediation, arbitration, and traditional uh, dispute resolution mechanisms. Now, this um, is where the courts themselves are sitting as courts and employing other methods of resolution of disputes, either by themselves or referring parties uh, to, for instance, the Nairobi Center for International Arbitration or private practitioners who handle alternative dispute resolution uh, cases. With that background, we then can touch on a few of the advantages of this alternative. Uh, what would uh, commend uh, uh, parties in a dispute to want to refer their dispute other than going to court to these other forms of dispute resolution. High on the list is confidentiality, and I'm here speaking to uh, the labor fraternity. It preserves the interests and privacy of the parties and issues in dispute. So if you take a typical uh, labor dispute uh, where maybe there's a contract of employment, uh, where there's uh, a contract that has confidentiality um, clauses, um, ADR provides a guarantee, a safety net, that uh, the privacy of the parties and the issues in dispute and their interest in the dispute will be uh, catered uh, for and protected. Then there's party autonomy. So here, for instance, if we have um, an employer and an employee, they can select the forum. I've mentioned a couple of methods there, mediation, arbitration, conciliation, um, and adjudication and other kinds of uh, methods, they can choose any one of these uh, methods uh, which will apply to their specific dispute, depending on maybe the sector, uh, depending on the sensitivity of the issue, or many other considerations that they may have that will lead them to settle for one method or another. In a sense, we have <coughs> um, a, a bag or a basket, we normally call it a cafeteria, where you select uh, any one of those methods that then um, 
you employ in the course of resol uh, resolving uh, your dispute. We move to the next slide. It is also cost efficient. Um, uh, you choose the method. You might even be able to choose the procedure, the rules. Uh, you can be able to determine your calendar, of course, mm -hmm. uh, in agreement with the person facilitating uh, the resolution of the dispute. Uh, this could be a mediator. It could be an, an arbitrator, depending on uh, the method that you're using. Uh, we also find that it is time effective. Every time you go to court, you are at the mercy of the calendar of the court. Uh, in alternative <coughs> dispute resolution, you will um, have an agreement uh, with the person facilitating the process that manages the time. So as opposed to being at the mercy of um, a list, in, in which case you attract behind many cases, um, you select a person, um, a neutral, uh, who apportions time for you, uh, hears you if it is an arbitration, or facilitates your agreement together with a mediation, um, adjudication and conciliation, a bit uh, more uh, involvement of the uh, neutral in the process, uh, thereby being able to manage uh, time. And also it preserves relationships, which is key, especially in labor disputes, uh, where um, for whatever reason that has brought parties to disputes, uh, sometimes they may want to preserve the relationship beyond the dispute. In fact, even facilitate uh, the continuity of uh, functions, even though there is a dispute. With that then in, in, in mind, we, I have just examined uh, for, uh, the landscape in Kenya in terms of the law uh, and ADR, and especially in the labor sector. So under the Employment Act um, in section 77.2, a labor officer who is presented with a claim after affording uh, both the employer and the employee uh, the opportunity to state their case, uh, they can recommend to the parties uh, what in his opinion would be the best means of settling the dispute. Now you already start to see that the employment uh, sector has already embraced the possibility that disputes can be resolved by multiple means. And here, uh, this means could be uh, one, of course, um, litigation, uh, which is going to court. The other is what we are referring to as alternative dispute resolution, uh, many kinds which have been dealt with by my colleagues here. Um, and then in the Labor Institutions Act, another provision there, section 1219, where the industrial court uh, may refuse to determine any dispute before it. So parties have approached the industrial court and the law is giving it power uh, to exercise discretion to allow the case to proceed before it, or um, accepting the case of an appeal or review, if it is uh, not satisfied that an, an attempt has been made to resolve the dispute through conciliation, which is an alternative dispute resolution mechanism, then it can refer that dispute back uh, to conciliation uh, to be uh, channeled through that uh, process. In section 58 um, of the Labor Relations Act, it also says that an employer, a group of employers or employers organization and a trade union may include or conclude a collective uh, agreement providing for uh, one, the conciliation of any category of trade disputes identified in the collective agreement. Uh, you note there by an independent and impartial conciliator appointed by agreement between the parties um, the other provisions were the court managing that process. In this case, the employer uh, and, and, and employers organization, trade unions here, uh, uh, agree by virtue of their collective uh, bargaining agreement uh, to appoint an impartial and independent conciliator as and when a dispute would arise. Also, it gives room for arbitration. The arbitration of any category of trade disputes identified in the collective agreement by an independent and impartial arbitrator appointed by the agreement uh, between the parties. So you see, uh, even within the structure of the legal uh, framework of uh, the labor sector, there's already an embracing of alternative dispute resolution. It goes further to say that an award in an arbitration in terms of a collective agreement is final and binding. So when parties participate 
in this other process, which is not a court process, uh, the outcome of that process, which is an award in arbitration, is final and binding, except in those circumstances when there's an appeal, uh, when it is set aside by the industrial court, uh, and in fact, it can be enforced by the industrial court. So it clothes it uh, with an equal force. Uh, once the court adopts it, it can enforce it, recognizes it, it can enforce it, uh, just as it would its own judgment, uh, giving you certainty that you are not participating as it were in an academic exercise. Um, then section 65 of the same act provides that after a trade dispute has been reported to the minister, uh, in this case, in charge of labor, the minister can or shall appoint a conciliator uh, to attempt to resolve the trade dispute. Now, again, here we see provision for conciliation. In other words, uh, within the labor sector itself, uh, it already has gone uh, a step ahead of many of the other sectors uh, to provide expressly for alternative dispute resolution in the course of resolving disputes, uh, whether they are trade disputes, employment disputes, uh, through other means other than going to court. If you also look at most of your human resource policies and procedures, uh, you will find that uh, within them, and especially for large organizations, uh, for instance, in uh, government organizations, you will have provisions for early detection, uh, prevention and management processes for disputes. You might also have a dispute tribunal, uh, which um, can apply alternative dispute resolution methods, negotiation, um, conciliation, mediation. You might have a dispute board or a dispute committee, again, uh, also given the liberty to employ some of these mechanisms. Um, and of course, uh, normally the apex uh, body there being a dispute appeals uh, body. Where uh, human resource policy uh, procedures provide, or in addition to them, when you look at, again, most of your employment contracts, which you um, enter into, uh, with your employees for your institutions, there is normally a clause, um, unfortunately, towards the end, and not very often very small, for providing for alternative dispute resolution. So it is normally uh, titled the dispute resolution clause. It may provide for in-house uh, ADR, alternative dispute resolution, within the institution. It might also allow for independent um, and normally uh, tired. So if you think of it in terms of a staircase, you try to resolve the dispute internally, you escalate it outside of the institution, or right from the beginning, it is struck outside the institution. So an independent, tired ADR uh, process. If we think of the background that you've just given, uh, the the imperative in the law that the law does acknowledge and provide for alternative dispute resolution mechanisms. Your own HR policies and procedures, uh, contracts of employment do provide uh, for alternative dispute resolution. Then it, it, it is an imperative for human resource practitioners to embed alternative dispute resolution skills as a critical tool to their functions in uh, work workplace uh, disputes. Why? Because uh, in most cases, you will be at some point or another involved in the process, either of reporting a dispute, referring uh, a dispute. Um, you might be uh, involved as a witness. Uh, you might be involved as a negotiator. You might even be involved as a conciliator or even going back to the legal framework. Whenever these disputes may be referred by court, to an independent impartial uh, conciliator. Um, HR practitioners would be missing out if they do not possess the requisite ADR skills to be called upon uh, to sit as conciliators, uh, mediators in trade disputes. Uh, therefore, uh, calling for enhancement of skills uh, in the ability to manage and resolve disputes, uh, complaints, grievances between workers uh, and the management uh, to also foster open communication um, and early dispute resolution 
because this minimizes the chance of a dispute escalating into um, litigation, legally actionable problems, uh, which then result in you losing control uh, over the, the, the process, uh, control over the outcome, um, the opportunity to preserve relationships, the opportunity for privacy and confidentiality, the moment the, the matter uh, goes to court. Now, depending on the sector you work in, uh, you could have a situation where uh, disputes are resolved, ev uh, are resolved even as uh, work is continuing. Or there could be issues to do with uh, trade and work-related uh, privacy agreements. Uh, for instance, uh, trade practice, uh, intellectual property rights, uh, some of the things that you would want to preserve uh, outside of uh, the resolution of the dispute itself. Now, given that uh, importance, moving to the next slide. When we look at our statistics of cases within the Nairobi Center for International Arbitration, uh, three main categories of agreements have, have resulted in disputes which have been referred to us. One is uh, supply and demand agreements, uh, that's uh, procurement agreements. Others are service agreements, uh, rendering of consultancy, and related services. And um, you can see there employment agreements also form a large portion of the kind of agreements which eventually uh, find disputes being referred to the center. And here I mean, uh, you have a contract of employment, you have agreed with, the employer has agreed with the employee that when a dispute arises, it will be referred uh, to the Nairobi Center for International Arbitration either for mediation or for arbitration. Um, and uh, in, in, in the period of time that we have been in operation, we have seen an increase in reference of disputes of this kind uh, to the center. Now, when we come to appointment of that neutral, the arbitrator, the mediator, or the conciliator, um, it, it, it is preferable that a person who has a background uh, in uh, these kind of disputes uh, be a neutral. It is not a necessity, it is not mandatory, but perhaps preferable that you uh, present this, this dispute to a person who understands uh, HR-related disputes or trade uh, disputes, um, which then begs the question, if we do not have human resource practitioners who are competent as alternative dispute resol resolution practitioners, these disputes will be referred uh, to other practitioners, uh, not uh, necessarily um, human resource. As we move to the next slide. So as a center, we do provide training programs in alternative dispute resolution. We do have uh, training in arbitration uh, from the basic level introduction all the way to advanced level, which is a fellowship certification uh, where you go through a modular training uh, that uh, takes about six months uh, in modules, module one, uh, module two, all the way to module three, to the point where you can be able to listen to uh, and write an award in uh, a dispute. Mediation, uh, again, from basic level introduction, uh, to be a mediator, a person who facilitates uh, two or more parties in a dispute uh, to arrive at an agreement that is their own and which they agree to enforce by uh, themselves. Um, here it culminates in a training of uh, 40 hour, uh, that is a five day training uh, where we do theory, uh, practice, role plays, and eventually cert uh, certify uh, one to commence the practice uh, of mediation. Of course, to continue uh, continuous learning, uh, CPD, uh, and eventually uh, become a competent mediator. And then also we do conduct in house customized training programs in alternative dispute resolution, which are sector-based, depending on your sector, uh, you could have peculiar requirements. We also do customized training programs uh, for that uh, kind of a need. Perhaps you might be asking the question, who can become or who can be a mediator? Uh, one, let me dispel the notion that disputes can only be resolved by those who have a legal background. 
uh, when we come to alternative dispute resolution, um, it is open to professionals from diverse fields, uh, not just those who have a legal background. Mm. I think there's, there's somebody else who is on speaker. So then back to the question who can become uh, a professional mediator. Um, and I've just dealt here with the generic qualifications or at least uh, characteristics. And one is uh, one, a person who has effective negotiation and interpersonal communication skills and is interested in facilitating parties to resolve disputes. Um, with, with what we understand human resource um, as a profession to be, um, you already can see uh, effective negotiation is almost a prerequisite for a HR practitioner. Interpersonal communication, again, a prerequisite for uh, an effective human resource practitioner. And of course, the interest of managing people issues, facilitating parties to resolve disputes, where one has those um, abilities, characteristics, innate uh, uh, personal traits, uh, makes a very good um, uh, preparation for a professional mediator. A person with an underlying professional field, in this case, uh, HR uh, or qualification uh, in a business or trade practice or familiarity with a cultural uh, and social environment. So you could have a wide range Have we lost Lawrence? Yes, they can't hear him. We give him a few minutes. Um, we give him a few minutes, could just be the network. Let me just call and get back to you guys. As we wait for Lawrence to come back, um, I hope you are learning, if you can put or whatever we are learning as we wait for him and our questions right there. Is we wait for him to come back. Can I just get to hear from you guys? Um, maybe even pass the program for him, let's see. Yeah. So two more minutes and we just, if he's not back, because I'm not able to get him on phone. Someone was saying they could not hear the speaker. I hope I hope we're all hearing because I could hear very well. Jacqueline, Miss Jacqueline, you can prepare to take the stage as we wait um, for um we'll, we can give Aaron some time at the end to finish on his presentation. For sure. Um, I hope you can hear me. I know I've also had some challenges with my... Uh... I can hear you very well. Okay, that is great. Yeah. So thank you very much. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good night, depending on where you are receiving us from on this webinar. I'm glad to be here. And I'm ready. Um, Jane, if, you, if I can continue. Or... You can continue, yeah. There's okay, someone great. who is speaking, I don't know who they are. Please mute your, mute your mic. Rebecca or Dede, please mute your mic. Okay. So, um, now I need to just... Slide show. Mm -hmm. Next, slide show. Just next, and a slide show. Yeah, I'm not sure. anyway, I'm not sure why it's not uh, it's covered. <laughs> We can see it. Eh? Just click on okay. slideshow and then say current here. Yeah. We can actually see the slide. Yeah, I'm trying to minimize this. I'm not sure why it's not coming down. Click on slideshow. 
Yeah, it's hidden. Is it here? Not sure why it's covering that, but uh, just give me mm -hmm. a moment. I'll be with you in just a jiffy. It is well. Okay, it has refused to minimize. Okay, let me see that. Oh, there you go. So, um, as I was saying, uh, good morning. I think most of us are here in Kenya. Um, today, um, I will be presenting on resolving corporate governance disputes through ADR. And Lawrence has done me the big favor of defining what ADR is. Uh, what I can say and uh, possibly uh, what I can share with you is that the, all of us, and I believe you are many uh, HR professionals present, all of us resolve disputes on a daily basis in our everyday uh, engagement. And uh, because we're engaged in the corporate sector, then we, have, we, uh, we should apply best corporate governance principles. So first, before I take on the question of ADR, allow me to just do a very high level recap of the best uh, definitions that we have currently. And I'll take the first one, which comes from the Kenyan scenario. And this is Mongozo, and it's the Code of Governance for State Corporations. The key definition is the one that is in the first line, although the rest is clearly is also uh, significantly important. And corporate governance is a structure and system of rules, practices, and processes by which an organization is directed, controlled, and held accountable. Basically, what Mongozo says is that the way we do our, or the way we organize ourselves, the things we do, that is what comprises of corporate governance. So that is best practice. It's uh, applicable to state corporations and mostly in the private, in the public sector. But it is the best. Uh, the, the, it, it's actually the best practice that we even borrow for um, for private sector as well. Um, we have had other definitions that we also refer to, which are useful in understanding what corporate governance is. And I will also take the one from OECD. This is for the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. It's uh, mostly a European-based uh, organization. However, they, it has a lot of influence in matters corporate governance. And uh, corporate governance, they have defined to mean the rules and practices that govern the relationship between managers, shareholders, and corporations. And this includes stakeholders like employees and creditors, and contributes to the growth and financial stability by underpinning market confidence, financial market integrity, and economic efficiency. The most recent definition of corporate governance, which uh, is the most progressive, is the one that is done and set out in King 4. And King 4 defines it as the exercise of ethical and effective leadership by the governing body towards the achievement of certain governance outcomes, ethical outcomes, good performance, effective control, and legitimacy. The key issue that I would also want to link with uh, King 4 uh, code of corporate governance is the aspect that they re recognize and they uh, promote and recommend alternative dispute resolution uh, to to be part to be part of the resolution or dispute resolution process because not only do we resolve disputes but we are also able to maintain social re uh, relationships and also the capital of a, of the organization reputation and uh, so many other um, uh, so many other aspects that are critical to running of organizations. So let's come back to disputes, because, okay, when we talk about alternative dispute resolution, it's usually alternative to litigation, going to court. You had Lawrence talk about, uh, let me have my day in court. Um, however, the word dispute uh, is usually used within context of we are fighting, there's a disagreement, and the word conflict always comes into play, especially when you work, when you consider workplace, the workplace, which is where most of the, of the HR professionals will find themselves. So 
when we look at uh, conflict within the workplace, the term that the term of art that has emerged is the workplace conflict. That's a term that you usually use, and you find that a lot of uh, ADR initiatives will be confined within the workplace conflict policy. If an organisation has one, or within that context, if it's not specifically defined. So workplace uh, conflict is interdisciplinary. That's why you hear us talking about corporate governance. Uh, I can see human resources is really making a huge debut. Uh, if this webinar is anything to go by, there's the legal aspect. And there could be any um, specialized areas um, where, this, um, where the workplace, workplace conflict can be considered. So it spans also very many micro interactions. And when we say micro interactions, it's that good morning when you're entering the office, um, the interdepartmental engagement, the different levels, and uh, when you talk about organizational levels, you appreciate the directors, that's uh, usually the management uh, of the organization, it's the organ that is required to take responsibility for managing an organization. But then there is how the directors and the board of directors interface with the top management whom they have delegated the responsibility of the day-to-day -day operations of the organization. So what happens is that in any company, there are multiple dimensions and uh, they are characterized by interdisciplinary boundaries. Many organizations, regardless of whether it is an SME or it is a medium-sized organization or one of the larger institutions, you find that there are at least two or three uh, discipline, disciplines. And when I say disciplines, that these are the professionals. So you, you, you can expect to find an accountant, you can expect to find an HR professional, you can expect to find engineers, architects, um, you can expect to find scientists, educators, depending on what sector or industry the organization finds itself. So there was a study that was done and proposed by Kochan, Katz and Mackenzie, and they talked about is either the three tier frame that looks at the director's level, the level of the management, and then how they interact with people outside, uh, usually with government. But uh, when you talk about government, we also put in the um, stakeholders, uh, suppliers, customers, anybody who has an engagement with the external, uh, or this is the political, social, social and environment, and the organization's decisions as they move along. So. Whenever we hear the word conflict, we usually approach it from a point of we are not so comfortable with it, we are not so happy about it, we think it's a bad thing. But the truth is, in every single society, in every single community organization, anywhere there are two or more people who are engaging and they have an interpersonal relationship, there is going to be conflict at one point or another and uh, on a day-to-day -day basis or in any engagement. Um, as an ADR professional myself, I say conflict is not necessarily a bad thing. It is not abnormal. It is not dysfunctional. In fact, it is a fact of life. Um, this was said by Mo, but it applies today just as well as when it was first written. So if you think about it, when you left your house in the morning, you probably had some conflict with your children when you were putting together breakfast or getting them to get into school. They're not on time. They have not packed. So we are used to this conflict and the conflict will follow us during the day, not as a bad thing, but as a check and a balance between how we are interacting and engaging with other people within our sphere of life and influence. In actual fact, the best teams that perform the best are those which have a measure of conflict. So the thing that we need to factor in is the aspect of how we use conflict and leverage it to our benefit. Now, I was going to demonstrate something with a table from Dr. Dana. Uh, he did it in 2000. It's called the retaliatory cycle of conflict. This is the aspect of conflict that we need to avoid. You know, um, if, for instance, when you get out in your, of your car in the parking lot, you open your car door and it bangs your neighbor, you get upset, and then instead of, uh, well, you apologizing, you ask them, why did you park like that? The natural reaction from that uh, engagement or that experience is that the other party will also get upset. Why did you bang your car, your door on my car? 
and it can you know it can escalate and escalate and get into a point where people are even banging each other's cars just to prove that I am right or just to get back at the other. I hope you get this presentation because there's a, there's a cycle. So you the, there's first the trigger, the trigger then uh, the trigger then makes or invokes a reaction from another person. So of course when there's a reaction there's another reaction and that reaction becomes a cycle. So it, you keep on retaliating until a conflict gets into unmanageable levels. So what we need to do is to break that retaliatory cycle and to break it in, um, in, a, in an organic way. So how do we do that? We approach conflict resolution by avoiding and preventing it. The best uh, step, and this is something you can do, you can implement this immediately at your workplace, at your desk today. First of all, manage differences. Understand that there will be disagreements. You will bump into each other at the wrong place at the wrong time. Somebody may have a problem at home and they may bring the issues into the office. So you need to also understand what are these tension points. And it takes a lot, of, it requires a lot of uh, intuition, uh, emotional intelligence, and also being able to engage with people on, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. If, when they are in a good mood or when they're not in a good mood, when they're in conflict and even when they're not in conflict, then you will appreciate, ah, that one is just a personality. There's nothing you can do about it. Those two just don't get along. Or the competition is just too high. They are being given impossible targets and each one is trying to feed into the other's uh, process. So it could be anything. So you have to be very keen to observe and identify where the pressure points are. When you do those two things, then you end up creating a healthy environment. Healthy environments are underscored by communication, continuous communication on a day-to-day -day basis, on uh, level, one level to the next supervisor to um, supervisee, and also from uh, say line manager to the people that they are supervising, line manager to the members of uh, the CEO usually, and then the CEO and the members of the board of the directors, and then ultimately to the shareholders. What happens is that when there's a healthy environment, people want to come to work, they want to perform, they want to achieve, and uh, when they achieve, then the bottom line uh, reflects this as well. So identify any causes of the tension points, Identify any causes, not only of the, uh, what may create conflict, but also what may avoid conflict, and try and put them in place, provided if you have the necessary resources. And resources is just not money, uh, it's usually time and also um, the engagement between the people who are working together. Listen carefully, and the reason why I set this out here is because HR, I think there's no other profession in any organization who is required to listen more carefully so they can be able to manage differences, locate tension points and create the healthy environment and also be able to pinpoint any causes that come up. And then find guides to self-resolution. My colleague uh, Wamaida is going to be talking to you, Madam Mediator. She'll talk to you about self-mediation. So I'm not going to delve into this uh, myself, but you need to start with yourself before you can find solutions for other people. And it takes training. It's not automatic. Sometimes it takes uh, a lot of years, many years of understanding yourself to understand your own triggers and know that when you are triggered, this is how you react to be able to know how to manage your own personal reactions so that you can avoid retaliatory cycles. Look for solutions, consider the solutions, and then um, if it's an individual issue, then decide on a solution yourself. If it's a solution that uh, uh, is an issue that requires more than two people to participate, maybe a team, maybe a project team, maybe a department, then decide on a solution together. Sometimes the solutions one department may decide may not necessarily agree with another department. So you may also need to factor that in and uh, figure out how you can, you know, uh, plug in and uh, have everybody speaking from the same page. So common issues or common sources of, um, let me just show you this for a minute, common sources of conflict on the director level and shareholder level is uh, when it comes to dividends and uh, usually this uh, also goes hand in hand with, okay, the profits and the losses. How are they uh, emerging? Why are they emerging? Uh, 
Now, how do we divide the losses if they occur? What about the dividends? If there's a good performance and their dividends, is there a policy? So it's good to be clear on such issues. When it comes to performance of tasks, sometimes it's not always clear. You know, we all communicate in different ways. And uh, so it is important to just take that moment and understand how responsibility for performance of tasks is being done. Whereas HR, you see that the technical people or uh, even ourselves, we are not uh, communicating well, then it is important to step in and ask for clarity on who is responsible to perform which task. Are they performing? Are they performing on time? Uh, because sometimes many of the conflicts that come in is you're waiting for a, a task to be finished by one department and it is feeding into another department so that they can take on the job and uh, accomplish, uh, usually especially within uh, project, like the project scenario. And then determining the level and care and skill that is expected from directors and management. Sometimes we take a lot uh, for granted. And it is important to be clear on who is supposed to do what, how are we appointing the directors, who are they, what are their qualities and uh, competencies, and the same thing with management and also um, all other members of staff. Where there are conflicting objectives, there is bound to be conflict. So it's also good to have clarity in objectives and uh, where are we going? We all need to know that. How does it fit in with our overall vision, mission, and objectives of the organization? How are we breaking this down into tasks? Are there any conflicts of interest? Are there any personal uh, interest? Is this something that somebody wants to make money of? Is it something, uh, and the other, one of the biggest problems with HR also is are the directors imposing people for you to employ? Are the people you're being imposed to be employed qualified and competent? Are they coming with ideas that are not necessarily in line with the culture of the organization? So you need to be, uh, to have a lot of emotional intelligence on how to manage this. And uh, issues relating to business ideas, decisions and uh, actions. Also resource allocation and where, when, when it, be, I mean, it's always, almost always uh, the case that resource interdependence is the case. So, uh, the other issue is, of course, the normal uh, personality clashes, conflict with your boss. You hear that either uh, on a personal level or you hear that from your colleagues. Interdepartmental, interdepartmental conflicts, workplace violence, and criminal acts in the workplace. These last two, um, they, you have to also have a specific policy on how to handle them and how the dispute resolution is going to happen so that those who are affected are also uh, either taken care of, if they're committing criminal acts, then they are apprehended. Uh, if there's violence, then the people who are the victims also need to be taken care of. So where do we start? I talked about being knowing yourself, uh, becoming a conflict competent leader, understand conflict dynamics, open your eyes, be observant, and you know, be proactive also about uh, minimizing conflict or dealing with conflict so that we only get the positives out of it. You have to have a lot of self-awareness. Self-control is a mandatory requirement for any person in HR and also at all the other people who are working in an organization with other people. That is something that we must all train ourselves. So, of course, uh, preventing... Okay, this is, this, is a, this, is a, this, is, this is a typographical error, sorry. So you should prevent responses negative responses to conflict and you should foster constructive responses to uh, conflict and then you should build a conflict competent um, organization. Well, there's also an image here to know them yourself also. There are those of us who are naturally coaches, we love to teach, we like to advise. There are those who are inventors, they may not necessarily want to talk about how they are going about the process of inventing. Uh, there are those who love to tell stories and uh, there are those who love to organize people know yourself and then encourage everybody else in your circle to appreciate themselves as well so let us let me talk a little bit about creating a conflict management system um, that is a matrix and uh, first of all you need to have your dispute resolution structure up to date show you something about the appropriate um, appropriate mechanism 
yeah, negotiation is usually <laughs> the first point of contact with any alternative dispute resolution uh, process. And uh, the appropriate way to approach level, uh, negotiation and also the appropriate style and anything works provided it is interest based and not position based anybody saying this is my position and i'm not going to you know usually the the term that the the, the best moniker that goes with that is my way or the highway that is not negotiation negotiation requires somebody to think okay so i understand where you're coming from um, but my interest is this how can we bring merge our interests or you know narrow the space between the, the, the interest uh, interplay between the two of us and then how is the chain of management where uh, do we need to go to if we're unable to negotiate who do we need to go to in, need, in case we need to uh, negotiate and then it will be either internal uh, i think uh, lawrence talked about having the internal mechanism systems of the organization it could be external uh, external now talks about uh, tribunals, starting with mediation, and also uh, he talked about conciliation. There's arbitration, and then there's ultimately court. So there's a spectrum, and all these things, conflict coaching, mediation, neutral evaluation, they're all part of updating the resolution sec uh, structure. And then the organizational support means that you should make this approach uh, organization wide and at different levels and have an approach to it that everybody appreciates and understands and it is clear. So ADR, allow me to just take a moment. Uh, Lawrence did a lot of the work I was going to do and uh, uh, mediation, I know my colleague uh, Grace is going to speak about it. Adjudication is a process that, okay, uh, it's mostly now technically found within construction, um, the construction industry. So, you know, uh, resolution of adjudication uh, of construction disputes, this is where you find, and this dispute review boards are also applicable under construction um, uh, uh, adjudication, but then their principle is the same. So whatever you call your dispute review board, the aim is to avoid conflict. Have somebody who is in charge of managing conflict, identifying it, and if it appears that it's becoming negative, dealing with it. And then there's arbitration, which is the term we usually use for anything that requires a third party to resolve. But as I will mention later, the Arbitration Act does not actually apply in the labor, um, in, within the Industrial Court uh, Act proceedings. Um, hmm. I think all my, uh, all, 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 all my, my images seem to have dropped off. Uh, but then basically the image that was here was really to identify negotiation, uh, mediation, and conciliation. Uh, what the courts are doing nowadays and what I believe is useful within the corporate governance structure within organizations is to use a multi-door approach so that we know that uh, it is possible to negotiate a dispute if it is there and lay it out and tell people, look, if you have a problem with your supervisor, negotiate with them at first. If you have a problem with your team, negotiate with them at first. If that doesn't bear fruit, then we can um, have negotiations with the line uh, manager. And then if we're not able to do that, then we can appoint a third party neutral, which is what a mediator is. And the mediator will guide the discussions or if you now need to go to the industrial court framework, then they, you will find um, a conciliator. And then appreciating that even court is, a, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's a legitimate way of resolving disputes, but it should be the last, the last resort. So knowing that you have this basket from which you can uh, approach conflict resolution, it broadens your scope and it enables you to say, you know what, okay, if this one didn't work, let's move on to the next in the spectrum. The legal framework, um, Lawrence also went uh, into detail quite a bit. Um, so Article 159 2C, um, there is the Arbitration Act, but Arbitration Act, as I said, does not apply uh, in proceedings before the Industrial Court. Uh, Employment Act, please take a look at sections 47, 48, 49, and 87. That's the dispute resolution clause. 
The Labor Relations Act, uh, there are two whole parts that are dedicated to dispute resolution, and it includes ADR. So does the Industrial Court Act. And then there is now the Civil Procedure Act and uh, rules, which, uh, and there are now directions for mediation, which have a whole regime that caters for how mediation should be, should be done within the court process. That doesn't mean that mediation is not available and applicable at organizational level. And the Nairobi Center for International Arbitration Act also does that, and the CIR arbitration rules as well, and their adjudication rules. There's a policy framework within the conduct, uh, construction industry. There is uh, ADR that is um, adopted by the industries with stakeholders to avoid litigation and save time. NCIA and IDLO also did a baseline assessment on the situation within Kenya's apl uh, uh, application of ADR mechanisms. It's, uh, done, it was done in 2018, and there was a validated draft that uh, was also done in 2019, and uh, more recently there was the NSC committee report, and also the IEK. IEK stands for the Institute of uh, Engineers of Kenya. So if you require outside assistance, the professional institutions that have lists of neutrals and they ordinarily appoint arbitrators, mediators, and adjudicators includes uh, uh, Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, Kenya branch. There's an Nairobi Center for International Arbitration. There's a Law Society of Kenya, the Institution of Engineers of Kenya, Architectural Association of Kenya, and the Institute of Quantity Surveyors of Kenya. And CIAP does train neutrals and undertakes continuous professional development. Now that I'm talking to IHRM, I'm hoping that we are also going to find, a for, you know, to formalize and institutionalize IHRM also to train neutrals uh, such as arbitrators, especially mediators, also conciliators to intervene in issues that are related to um, HR. If you look at the committee report that I spoke about, it proposes a dispute resolution bill, which is very comprehensive. There is a construction adjudication bill, as well as uh, amendments to the Arbitration Act. The dispute resolution bill speaks a lot to mediation and conciliation, which are very, very appropriate to anything that is corporate, governance-oriented, and specifically to human resource uh, disputes. And, uh, you know, what happens is that once we streamline and we have clarity, then hopefully we'll find fewer cases going to um, the court. Uh, we call it the employment court. That is the court which is the court for employees. So actually, one of the things, uh, and I think I, IHRM should, actually, uh, should aggressively pursue this, is to find a system not only that caters to confidentiality, and allows people to, you know, to, to, to resolve disputes within the ADR framework, but also gives the employ, employer an opportunity to, you know, to have an, a negotiating basis. Because the truth, and I speak to you as an, ad, I'm an advocate of the High Court of Kenya, and I do employment matters, and there is a definite, uh, you know, preferential treatment to any employee who prefers a case in the industrial court. So what I'm proposing and what I hope uh, you have your take home from here is that let us combine good corporate governance uh, principles by incorporating ADR uh, within the corporate structure and specifically within HR resolution of workplace conflict. And uh, let us not only uh, institutionalize it, but formalize it so that everybody gets a hearing and uh, when I'm talking to people who are managing uh, uh, staff, you appreciate what it can do to, first of all, making things be resolved faster, be resolved on an interest-based uh, level, and uh, also to save uh, time and also to save um, expenses. I think I will rest here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jackie. That was a lot of learning there. That was a lot of learning and a lot of information that we could use. And I just remember that when we lost uh, Rollins, I did not introduce you properly. So I'm going to introduce you and then we move to the next speaker uh, for the purpose of people just understanding and appreciating um, your profile. So ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce, um, to just read the profile for, for Jackie. 
for us just to appreciate who she is and her credibility in speaking about the topic that she's speaking about today. So Jackie Wehenya is a practicing advocate of the High Court of Kenya. She holds a Master of Laws, uh, Public Finance and Financial Services Law in the Bachelor of Laws degree from both of them from the University of Nairobi. She's also a fellow of both the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and the Institute of Certified Public Sectors and a owned and experienced mediator with numerous mediation qualifications ranging from being a Chartered Mediator of the Institute of Chartered Mediators and Conciliators 2018, Kenya Judiciary Accredited Mediator, International Mediation Institute, uh, Certified Mediator, and Fever Approved Mediator. Fever, the one for football, Jackie confirm. Jacqueline is the vice, Jackie, that one? No, yes, it is FIFA of uh, go, 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 ale, 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 football. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So okay. Jacqueline is the current vice chair of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, Kenya branch, and the vice chair of the Mombasa Law Society. She's the vice chair of the Kenya National Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Mombasa chapter, a member of the National Steering Committee for the Formulation of the Alternative Dispute Resolution, uh, policy 2020-2021 and an associate editor for a certain journal. She's a member of the ICS Council where she is further accredited as a governance auditor. She's a legal and compliance auditor, Kenya School of Law. Jackie, that is such a rich profile and we are privileged to be listening to you today. So um, uh, thank you very much for the session, guys. Keep the questions coming. Jack will respond, Lawrence will respond when we're finishing. And now we go to that speaker. Uh, Gladys for Maida. Allow me to introduce Gladys. Gladys, are you ready for us? There she is. So I'll introduce Gladys and then I'll give her the floor. So Gladys for Maida has over 20 years experience and is an expert in commercial, civil litigation and dispute resolution. She believes everyone is entitled to an even playing field and every dispute can be resolved if it is managed efficiently, professionally and is cost effective. She's a holder of a Bachelor of Arts, uh, of Arts Bachelor of Laws degrees um, at Postgraduate Diploma in Law from the Kenya School of Law, an accredited mediator from the Kenya Judiciary, and is currently pursuing a Master of Arts degree in Human Rights at the University of Nairobi. Gladys Wamaida undertook the 4 year mediation training with the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators in 2009 and has practiced as a mediator since then. She enrolled with FIDA Kenya Mediation Pro Bono Program, where she currently undertakes Monday family mediations. The alternative dispute resolution process is a positive alternative method of achieving an amicable solution between parties and has achieved positive results with parties opting, opting and advocating for mediation as a better option to civil litigation. On 1st February 20, 20, 2013, she presented a paper on the role of informal justice system in Kenya in responding to gender-based violence in Kenya in the FIDA Kenya workshop for mediators. With the introduction of the court annex mediation panel program in 2016 as a form of dispute resolution as a campus in article 159 of the kenya constitution uh kenyan judiciary she was accredited as one of its mediators where she has conducted commercial civil family and workplace mediations to date with a success rate of about 85 percent wow if it was in a class jackie i would say let's clap for you uh not jackie but gladys uh, due to her experience, in 2017, she was appointed by the Mediation Accreditation Committee of Kenya and Judiciary to train and equip the senior, the senior judiciary staff on the process of mediation. In the latter part of 2018, she participated as one of the panelists at the first International Nairobi Center for International Arbitration Conference. She's a certified trainer in mediation and has conducted the 40 year mediation training program since 2019 to date. She's an active member of the Law Society of Kenya the Law Society of Kenya Disciplinary Committee established under the Advocates uh, Act, Cap 16. Law Society of Kenya, SACO, as a board member. Uh, she's also an active member of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, the Nairobi Center for International Arbitration, and the Federation of Women Lawyers, FIDA, Pro Bono Legal Aid Scheme. Wow, 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 uh, Gladys. Karibu sana, please take it away. Let us start from your wisdom. Uh, thank you very Gladys. much. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? We can hear you very well, Gladys. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, I'm quite humbled. And it's a uh, great uh, opportunity. Uh, I am really humbled to present this paper 
or in respect of uh, mediation in the workplace and labor related disputes. Um, I think I would not go into the legal framework which has been handled by uh, my learned colleagues, Mr. Muirore and uh, uh, Jackie Wehenya. So I'll just go straight into what mediation is all about and mediation in the workplace. So um, uh, I don't know, uh, let me go to the next slide. Uh, it's not moving. I wonder why. Just give me a moment so I can see if I can be able to, to move the slides. Um, sorry about that. Not a problem. I don't know. Um, you can use the tab. Sometimes it misbehaves. The tab? Yeah, you can use the tabs to see if it will help you move. Okay, so can you see that? Not can you yet. See the... uh, okay. Can you see it now? Not yet. You might have to share fresh. Can you see it now? It's now starting. Um, there we are. Just now make the screen bigger. Slideshow. Slideshow. Oh my. <laughs> it's okay. Okay. Can I just uh, present it without uh, the okay. slides? Mm. Because no, you then... can. We can see. We can see. I guess everyone is seeing from their screen, so we still can see. I think it's okay. Uh, can you see that? The next slide. Yes, it is small, but we can see. Yeah. What is mediation? Okay, um, so let me just, uh, if I make it bigger, then it's not moving. I don't know why. So can I share it the way it is? I think that's okay. I'm able to see. I hope the rest are also following from their laptops. All right. So um, I won't go into the legal framework of, uh, of, of uh, that governs mediation or ADR because that has been compressed comprehensively dealt with by Mr. Muirore and uh, my learned colleague, uh, Ms. Jackie Wahenya. So I'll just dwell uh, directly into what mediation is. And then, so I will talk about what mediation is, the role of the mediator, the difference between mediation and arbitration, then what is work, uh, workplace mediation, what could cause conflict in the workplace, when should mediation be used? The benefit of mediation, the mediation process, and the conclusion. All right. So, uh, what is mediation? Yeah. So, mediation is uh, an informal, confidential process that allows the intervention in a negotiation or a conflict of an acceptable third party, who now we call the neutral, who has limited or no authoritative decision-making power, but who assists the involved parties to voluntarily reach a mutually acceptable settlement of issues in dispute. It's very private and non-binding, although the agreement reached by the parties can become legally binding once it's put into writing. And sometimes uh, some parties request, especially in the court annex mediations, the agreement is filed in court and it's adopted as an order of the court before the judge. So in addition to addressing substantial issues, mediation may also establish or strengthen the relationships of trust and respect between the parties or terminate relationships in a manner that minimizes costs and physical harm. At least the parties, even though they didn't get everything that they got, they go having so sorted out the dispute and they are able to at least um, amend the relationships. It's described as a non-adversarial system for resolving conflicts and disputes. 
So as we know, as advocates well, or law, when you go to court, there's always a winner and a loser. Yeah, because the, the judge makes a decision as to who wins the case and who doesn't. So you find that it, it escalates. If one party does, is not satisfied, let's say they're in the chief magistrate court, they go to the high court, they go to the court of appeal, and now we have the Supreme Court. But in respect of uh, mediation, it's a win-win. Both parties win, win because it's a process of give and take. You don't sometimes get everything. You give a little, take a little, so that you resolve your conflict in an amicable way. So um, what's the role of this uh, mediator, this uh, third party neutral? So the aim of the mediator is to bring about a resolution which is acceptable to both parties and find a solution that they are able to uh, live with. The mediator in the room is the facilitator and his role purely is to allow the parties to, to give the parties the best opportunity of making a deal. So how does the mediator do this? They do this by assisting and guiding the parties towards their own resolution. They help and, uh, parties understand the other parties perspective because usually you'll find it's an issue of perspective of one particular dispute or conflict one issue the way the parties perceive it can be totally different and because of that there is a dispute or conflict so the mediator helps the parties understand and focus on the important issues and understand the need of reaching a resolution so the, what the mediator does is sit through the facts, the emotions, the interests of the parties, the, the needs as well, to help determine what are the issues and what is a fair outcome to the parties. The mediator also helps the parties clarify the issues, yeah? the main issues, the agreed issues and assess the strengths and weaknesses of each party, yeah? And then they offer them opportunities and help them by asking open-ended questions, closed questions, hypothetical questions to enable them have innovative solutions while remaining neutral and unbiased, all right? And then now we've heard about uh, uh, what my learned colleague, uh, Ms. Wahenya indicated about, okay, there's no arbitration in labor uh, matters, but we, it's good if we know the difference between arbitration and mediation. So arbitration is, a statutory, uh, is statutory controlled, it's very formal, and it's a private tribunal where the parties choose the arbiter. It is a legal way of solving disputes outside courts. And it's usually contained in the contract that is binding between the two parties. They always have an arbitration clause. So that gives them the power to choose the arbiter. Uh, now the decision that the arbiter makes is known as an award and is imposed on the parties and is legally binding. Yeah. So this is different from uh, mediation, which is informal. And the mediator is not the decision maker. The parties are the decision makers. And the agreement that is, uh, the parties come up with is an agreement made by the parties and can only be binding, uh, can only be binding if it is written and executed by the parties, yeah? So the arbitration is either agreed by the parties or can be nominated by a professional inst institution. So likewise, the mediation is, uh, is, uh, is agreed by the parties, but now uh, people question because in the case of court annex mediation, it, uh, the, part the parties are nudged towards mediation, but they must agree to undergo mediation and they, there's a consent to mediate that the parties sign and 
the, the parties are the ones who uh, nominate the, the mediator, either through the quarter next or, or, or they, they, they appoint the mediator themselves. The Chartered Institute and Nairobi Center for International uh, Arb uh, Arbitration have a panel of mediators. So parties can also approach these institutions and they, are, they appoint a mediator. So uh, arbitration is binding for mediation. It's not binding until the parties have the agreement put down in writing and they execute the same. Now, let's talk about mediation in the workplace. Now, conflict in workplaces takes a high toll all round and without a solid guide of resolving conflicts correctly leads to disastrous uh, results. Now, what is the root cause of most conflicts in the workplace? Yeah, there's opposing positions where somebody has position, I, I am right, the other part of person feels they are uh, right based on their perspective. There's power struggles, there's ego, pride, jealousy, <laughs> performance discrepancies, compensation issues, or sometimes it's somebody having a bad day. You'll find the, where there's poor communication or the inability to control one's emotion leads to the breakdown of, uh, of relationships. Also, poorly defined job roles, yeah, and unclear objectives, yeah. So, for example, the roles and expectations could have changed, you know, as, as you are moving on as a, uh, as a company and you're expanding, yeah, the roles and expectations could change. But what about the communication? Has it also gone at the same pace with the changes that are being implemented in the company. Changes in processes and revised working uh, practices. Yeah, like now with COVID, uh, things have totally changed. And uh, now we are, we've all gone uh, digital. People are working from home. Have, with the changes of these processes and revised working practices, have they been managed well? Has what the expectations of the management been communicated well to the, the employees? If they haven't, they, they, they would lead to a lot of uh, disputes and conflicts. Yeah, the clashes between individuals about a task completion, yeah, or personal values, goals, or expectations. So research indicates that countless times, otherwise smart, capable people place the need of emotional superiority ahead of achieving the collective company mission. Now, what could cause conflict in the workplace? As individuals, we vary greatly in our responses to every given situation. It's all about perspectives. And we have different triggers. Uh, Ms. Mahenya uh, alluded to that. What pushes one person's buttons will not necessarily push mine. Sometimes I'll deal with it negatively or even not be moved by it. So someone's red flags or hot buttons are bound up in their identity, their individual experiences and how they see themselves or want the world to see them, yeah? We get triggered when we feel something important about us, our identity or our safety is being threatened or, or we perceive it to be threatened. Now, the important thing to remember is that we do not all have the same triggers, but many of us expect everybody else to respond and react as we do. How often do we hear someone say, I can't understand what his problem is or her problem is, yeah? It wouldn't bother me. This is because we are not identical and our reactions and responses would definitely be different. There are however common conflict triggers that many people share, although the response to these triggers will vary depending on the individual's personality. We are all totally different. 
This tends to fall into one of the following four categories. Now, if a person feels that they are being ignored, not being listened to, respected, or their competency is being questioned, yeah, or their worth as an individual is questioned or degraded, or someone appears to be trying to control you, keeping you from something you need, or threatening your independence and safety. Yeah, so those are the triggers. And because once that happens, when it's triggered, there'll be a reaction. Once there's a reaction, there will be a result. And usually that result is the conflict, yeah? So what is the cost of this conflict? There'll be definitely decline in performance because this person is always anxious or stressed. Because they are anxious and stressed, they're not happy in the, in the environment they are working in. What does that lead to? Them not reporting to work. Many times they are sick or they, they always have an excuse. So there's decline in uh, the employee well-being. Yeah, what does that mean? <laughs> Business effectiveness goes down. The customer experience, I think every company is up about customer experience, that the customer experiences uh, some, a, a good feeling so that they would buy the product. But if there's uh, the, in the atmosphere, there's a lot of anxiety, there's a lot of stress, the employees are not handling the, 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 the customers well, there's definitely a, a revenue. The revenue will also be, uh, will reduce, reduce in teamwork, and there's no competitive advantage. Because of this conflict, constant conflict in the organization, there's increased cost to the employer as he has to deal with the matters going to court. He has to go, uh, also the matters going to the labor relations office and even disciplinary procedures. So work is not moving because you're dealing with these disputes and conflicts constantly. So, why is mediation a good idea? And why are we advocating for now human resource uh, practitioners to undertake this mediation, uh, uh, to think about or take mediation as an option uh, and as an option? Now, employment matters are very personal, in particular to the employee and the employer. Secondly, court proceedings are lengthy and they cause harm. It's adversarial. Court matters are adversarial. So they cause both harm to emotionally, psychologically, and financially. Yeah. And the toxic, to, you know, it's toxic in the sense that we are fighting against each other and we maintain our position and our rights. So if that's what we are going for. We are going to war, we are going to, it's combative. So it's very toxic. So the other uh, element is that there's little or no risk, yeah, because of the confidentiality of the matters that might be shared or the dispute, the, the, the issue, there's some issues that are very confidential in court. It's, uh, you, uh, it's public. Everybody will hear your nitty gritties unless you ask court to, have, uh, to proceed in camera. But in respect of uh, mediation, it's purely confidential. All the matters that are discussed in that room remain in that room, whether it's a joint session or the private session. So all the, the issues pertaining to the uh, company remain confidential. So it also allows for out of the box considerations, not uh, what the law says, okay? The law, we, the mediation stays within the confines of the law. And uh, my learned colleagues, Mr. Moirore and uh, Ms. Wahenya have this put down before you the legal framework yeah, that governs ADR. 
Mediation stays within that legal framework, but it deals with the interests and needs of the parties. So those interests and needs are taken into consideration as the parties come into a, an agreement. If there are advocates in the room and have been retained either by the, the, the employee or even the company or the institution itself has its own in-house advocates, the legal rights of each of the parties and the inter interpretation of the law is protected. As I said, mediation stays within the confines of the legal framework that governs uh, the, the, Kenya. So the, so the settlement in mediation is forward looking. The mediator asks the, the parties, how do you see the future when this dispute is resolved? Let's move from the present position where there's this dispute, where you two are not seeing eye to eye. How would the future look for each of the parties? Yeah, and so that now, based on the future, they are able to work backwards, yeah, and come with a structured uh, uh, settlement, which the court cannot provide. And above all, it's very cost effective because you'll find that, uh, yes, I'm an advocate by profession. My primary profession is uh, law. We will file a suit and the minimum period that it takes to have a judgment is three years. Come to mediation. Mediation can take a day, two days but not more as the, the court annex mediations. We have 21 days within which to settle that mediation, that dispute. Yeah, look at 21 days if it's the maximum as the, uh, 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 provided by the court annex mediation. And three years, 15 years, 30 years, just in respect of one dispute. Yeah, so, each institution has, has uh, consideration, uh, the options that they have to, uh, when they have a, a dispute. The first one is the grievance procedure. Every company has this, the grievance procedure. However, the process rarely in identifies the root cause of the conflict. It can polarize the parties and it creates a blame and litigation culture. You can have the internal mediation. This is a, can be an effective process. However, it's important that the neutral third party is trained and qualified. Yeah, like we have the Kenya Revenue Authority has this internal mediation when it comes to disputes uh, in respect of tax. But the question is, is there a conflict of interest of the mediator? Yeah. The, like in KRA, the, the mediator is an internal employee of the institution. So we question, are they truly objective? Are they truly uh, neutral? Yeah. But it is an effective uh, process. But then, there's an, the external mediation, which, which is open to the parties, where the mediator is a third, is a third neutral, third party neutral, is neutral, and he's not part of the institution. Yeah, so the mediator here is impartial, is non-judgmental, He's, he empowers the parties. If there's, uh, there's always a power imbalance between employer, employee, but because of the skills that they have learned in mediation, in the mediation course, they learn how to balance these imbalances. So in the room, the employer, employee are equal. The mediator is also neutral. He's a neutral party in that particular room and helps the parties giving them uh, facilitates the parties giving them the best opportunity of making a deal 
the mediator challenges the different perspectives that the, par the parties have, but op the questions that they ask, yeah? They promote dialogue. They are safe pair of hands in the sense that the parties are, are, are equal and they facilitate the parties identifying their interests and needs so that they can get an amicable solution. They manage the, 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 a safe process so that there is no violence. They know how to handle deadlocks. They know how to, uh, based on their skill that they've learned, they are able to manage the emotions as well. The mediator is also objective in respect of that dispute. They, they are not biased. They don't take sides, yeah? They are solution focused. The mediator, when it comes to outbursts of emotions, they are empathetic. They are a very active listener. And you know, uh, listening is not just the words that are spoken by the parties, but it is their body language and the tone of voice, which communicates a lot. And because of the mediator's trainer, Training, they are able to identify when some, just by the body language, what that party is saying. They build understanding. The mediator is informal, not that, uh, the, okay, like advocates and the arbiter and the judge are very formal in the way that they conduct their court or their tribunal, the arbiter, arbiter the tribunal. It is, has procedures which must be adhered to. If it comes like in court, you file a plaint from a plaint, you go to the defense, from the defense, you go for pre-trial, from pre-trial, uh, you have to have the written submission, as written statements, document, list of documents, list of witnesses, and then you go for hearing. It's very procedural. It's very structured. Yeah, and when uh, when it comes to arbitration, it also has its regulations, it has its uh, procedures. But when it comes to mediation, though it is uh, the from the training, you're taught how to the process of the mediation. It can be informal. Even the way you dress is informal. For advocates, they have to dress in a certain way. The judge has to dress in a certain way. But when it comes to mediations. It is informal, if, even to the point of the way it, you dress, the, uh, the sitting arrangement is not even formal. And the mediator respects all views, okay? So when should mediation be used? So anytime when there's a dispute between parties that can't be resolved without the help of a, a neutral third party, yes? Before even they come to the neutral third party, the, the parties themselves have tried to negotiate and the, neg the, the negotiation has not been fruitful. So they invite a neutral third party to help them yeah, get a solution. It, uh, mediation should be taken as early as practical. Yeah, and the, hence, when the employer and the employee agree to mediation, when the employer maybe receives the first demand, yeah, the demand letter, that, and then the, 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 the party threatens to go to court, the, the, the employer and employee can decide and agree, let's take mediation before, the option of ADR through mediation before you go to court. because. If the, uh, the institution wants to mini mi minimize uh, legal costs, they can take up a mediation, yeah? Maybe the, 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 the employee uh, 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 finds that the, taking the matter to court might be very expensive because they must en engage an advocate, fa pay filing fees and all that. It's, it has a cost implication. The institution itself, has to engage an external advocate, lawyer, has to also pay uh, legal fees. Why don't they, if they would desire to minimize legal costs, 
they have the option of mediation. It also eliminates uh, impediments to settlements. The employee's personal problem is treated very fairly and it allows the parties to think outside the box as mediation is interest-based. Yeah, it's not rights-based, it's interest-based. And it allows the parties to move on and addresses the psychological uh, impact, especially where a party's, uh, uh, an employee's uh, services have been uh, terminated. So it reduces uh, the, the psychological impact because in mediation, it is win-win, yeah? So what are the best benefits of mediation? Yeah, it's very informal as I had indicated and flexible, yeah? The advocates are not necessary. Though some parties feel that their advocates uh, should be in the room, but the advocate there is as an advisor, but doesn't take active uh, participation in the mediation. There are no formal rules of evidence, no witnesses, no filing of pleadings and all that. It's very confidential, both on, on two uh, levels. In the joint session, everything that's discussed in the, in the joint session remains confidential. And, and when the, the mediator feels that they require to have private sessions with the parties, Whatever is discussed in the private session remains confidential until the parties allow the mediator to share it with the other party. Also, the mediation proceedings are not recorded or transcribed. And at the conclusion of the mediation, all the notes that have been taken by the mediator himself, by the parties, is destroyed, okay? It's quick and expensive, as I indicated. Uh, when parties want to get on with their business and their lives, mediation is, a, is an option to consider. It takes less time to complete. As I indicated, one day, two days, five days, maximum 21 days. Allowing an earlier solution than is possible through uh, court, yeah? Now, um, Moreover, mediation generally produces or promotes greater degree of party control. Mediation is, is party autonomous. The parties negotiate their own settlement and have more control over the outcome of their dispute. Parties have an equal say in the process because the mediator has balanced both parties, the employer and the employee. There's no determination of fault but rather the parties reach a mutually agreeable resolution to their conflict. It preserves relationships, okay? Because it's an issue of interest and needs and not rights, yeah? So even the settlement that the parties come up with, it is an amicable settlement that is workable for both parties. And because it's an amicable settlement, it's mutually satisfactory, yeah? It's comprehensive and uh, customizes their agreements. Uh, they re uh, mediated agreements often help resolve procedural and interpersonal issues that are not necessarily, uh, a, a, you're not able to join the, in a legal determination. The parties can tell and make their own settlement depending on their particular situation and circumstances. And mediation is a foundation for future problem solving. After a mediation uh, resolution, if a subsequent uh, dispute occurs, or there's a problem in the implementation of that uh, uh, settlement, parties are more likely to utilize a cooperative forum for, of problem solving to resolve their differences than to pursue an adversarial approach. So how does the mediation process take place? Both parties uh, meet the mediation, mediator alone, yeah? The parties confirm that they wish to undergo the mediation by signing the consent to mediate 
before the mediation process commences. The consent to mediate will set the ground rules for both parties, also have a clause to deal with confidentiality without prejudice and authority and status of the parties in the room. The parties will uh, select a neutral lo location for the mediation, yeah? Then the timelines are agreed upon, whether a full day, a half day, or multiple days. Then a meeting will take place between the parties, the mediator, which is a, we call the joint session. And, and it's where the mediator will have the opening session, where he will introduce himself, establish the ground rules, establish that uh, it's a voluntary process, that uh, it's uh, ex explain to them uh, the principles of uh, mediation and establish that the parties in the room have authority to make a decision, yeah? Then uh, allow the parties, maybe this is the first time that the parties are communicating in the same room, allow the parties each of them to give their side of their story, yeah? Their, their side of the story, while the other one is listening quietly to perceive and understand where the other party is coming from, yeah? Then, once each party has uh, given their story, frame the issues, yeah? Then have the parties agree on the issues then these issues are explored, yeah? And even this, ex uh, the mediator may explore these uh, issues jointly or in the private session. And if, and then allows the parties to exchange their proposals. This is by exploration, a stage in mediation we call exploration, where the parties come up with their proposals and those proposals are exchanged between the parties so that they can get an agreement. So once uh, an agreement is reached, it's drafted and explained to the parties and their advocates. The advocates can, the mediator also can give the, uh, the advocates the opportunity to draft that agreement since they have been in the room, they have witnessed the process. Once the agreement is, uh, is drafted, it is signed by the, by the parties and witnessed by the mediator in the present, presence of their representatives. Their representatives could be the advocates, could be the, their leaders in their, in their community or in, in an institution, maybe the CEO or whoever uh, is to, uh, to witness. Then with time in workmen, uh, workplace and neighbor relation disputes, there can be an evaluation after a, a period of time and a reflection and follow up. You know, how is this uh, settlement working? Yeah, based on the mediation that we undertook. Now, in conclusion, what if the mediation isn't resolved? There is a lost opportunity. The conflict continues. Nothing is said or disclosed in court. So whatever happened in the, in the mediation cannot be shared in court. So you're starting afresh. And there's some issues you cannot say. What, what you said in the mediation, you can, you're saying something contrary here in court. Whatever is shared or disclosed in the mediation cannot be shared, uh, cannot be used in court. There, there, will be, there will be the benefit of disclosure in the mediation itself. You can pour out, each party can pour out their, their heart or each party can divulge the actual perspective or issues that they cannot do in court. There'll be a better understanding of the other party's position and perspective. And the parties will all be able to even appreciate the interests and needs of the other party. What if the mediation is not, is, uh, that's, uh, uh, if the mediation is resolved, the conflict comes to an end. Yeah, there's a solution. And the parties are able to move on 
to other constructive things. And it allows the employee and the company or the institution to heal. While the parties may not have got everything that they wanted in the settlement, the dispute has ended. And both parties have saved a lot, a lot of money. Thank you very much. I'm open to questions. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. Uh, Gladys, you have done a lot of justice to that topic of um, mediation. I have never had it explained that well. So thank you very much for your time. We now have seven minutes before we can end the, the, um, the webinar. And therefore, I'm going to open for all the panelists the questions. I see we have some questions that have already been typed. Maybe we can start with that. Um, just to confirm that Lawrence is in, uh, Jacqueline and of course Gladys. And the first question is, how do you document the resolutions just in case one of the parties may dispute in future? I guess this is for mediation. This could go for you, Gladys. Can you repeat the question? I didn't hear it. How do you document the resolutions just in case one of the parties disputes the same in future? That is from Faith Mwende. Okay, so what I personally do, sorry, let me just put on the camera. Mm -hmm. Now, after mediation, you've gone through the process. The parties have agreed uh, and it has been, once the parties agree, ensure that it is written down. You uh, write down an agreement, the parties sign. They sign in your presence, you as the mediator also sign. Now, I, I remain with a copy, the parties have copies. But in my private uh, mediations, personally, what I do to ensure that it's enforceable, I file it in court. Now, there's in court that we have the court and uh, next mediation, they have a registry. So I file it in that registry and it is adopted. Uh, I don't, uh, maybe uh, uh, it's adopted as an order of the court. So it becomes also legally binding. No party can let subsequently come and say, I didn't agree. So wow. once it's got the seal of the court, then that way it now it's just like how we, we file documents in the land's office. We have the seal of the land registrar that it's registered as a document, a legal document. The same way I file it at the, uh, the uh, mediation registrar's uh, registry and it's, it's sealed and it becomes a legal document. Well, thank you, Gladys. We have another question that I think also goes to you that says, um, what is the estimated cost of mediation from Joy Mbele? Okay, so the cost of mediation, uh, it, different institutions have different uh, remunerations. Like if you go to uh, a chartered institute, they have their, 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 their scale. Nairobi Center for International uh, Arbitration also has its own scale. But most uh, mediators charge, some charge per hour, others charge per day. So it depends with uh, the mediator. But there's no hard and fast rule of how much people are going to charge. So most of the, uh, most people go as per the institutions, the remunerations that the institutions have as a baseline. But uh, some some uh, charge uh, uh, based on the value of the dispute. Well, thank you very much, Gladys. We have another one for you, and I think the last one. So we also give. Uh, the rest of the panelists time to also answer something uh, we have one from Lipton that says is is intersentiment agreement legally binding without being adopted by the court is a contract enough yes yes an agreement is as long as it's signed by the parties is legally binding mm -hmm. but I always put that rider mm -hmm. okay that so that now it, uh, the parties are comfortable but as long as they've signed it, it's legally binding. It's a contract. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, 
Thank you, thank you so much, Gladys. And now we have a question that I think goes to Lawrence. And someone is asking, how much are the trainings? Do you have a calendar? You're muted, you're muted, Lawrence. You're muted. Am I audible now? Yes, you are. Okay. So, yes, we do have a calendar. Um, in terms of mediation, uh, we have a structure uh, which uh, includes a one-day introduction, uh, sorry, four-hour introduction, uh, which is virtual uh, at 20,000. Um, then two extra modules, that's module one, which is the five days in-person training at 60,000. Uh, module uh, two, uh, which is two months uh, in virtual, uh, it is, uh, should correct, there should be 70,000. And then a course which is an introduction to ADR and litigation, so an introductory uh, awareness creation, capacity building in ADR generally, which is a four hour virtual course at 20,000. That's for mediation, for arbitration, we have an introduction for four hours, a virtual 20,000, uh, module one, uh, which is a one month course, which is 80,000, uh, module two, uh, which is two months, which is virtual uh, 55,000, um, and the last one, which is uh, module uh, three, which is 70,000. Uh, we do have a training calendar. I think at the point at which my presentation was uh, uh, stopped, I would have shared the calendar. Uh, next week, there is a mediation training course for the 40-hour um, module uh, module one, uh, which is physical in person. Some of the presenters here will be facilitating that uh, training. Uh, so for any person who uh, wants to undertake um, the 40-hour training, which gives you the skill to be a mediator, to start off as a mediator, as you increase uh, capacities in other disciplines, uh, there's, there's that opening for... Uh, next week, which will run for five days from the 5th uh, all the way to the 10th uh, of May. And it is a continuous calendar, uh, which offers these courses continuously. So maybe we shall provide... Share. If it will not take long, you could share maybe just... If you yes. Can we... in a minute, because now we are time bad. Okay. So maybe, Sarah, you can share uh, the last bit of the presentation. However, this information will be available to the participants and... Mm -hmm. Yes, so for those who in, would want to participate in uh, Module 1 for mediation, uh, it is slated for 4th May to 10th May, which is a 40-hour training. It is both theory um, and role play, uh, where you get to sit in as a, um, a, a mediator, you sit in as a participant, you get to see the different roles in a mediation, as I've been described by uh, Gladys. And the cost is 60,000 uh, physical in, in person, which will be held uh, here at the cooperative bank house uh, on the eighth floor. Um, and then introduction to ADR and litigation, which will be our last course for this uh, year, that is uh, ending June on the 31st May. It's virtual. It's a four hour duration course, uh, costing uh, 20,000. This gives you um, an introductory um, capacity to then enter into the training for mediation and arbitration. It gives you the basic skills that of, of knowledge that you need uh, to then engage in the more specialized courses. We have a training calendar, uh, which is coming up for 2022-2023, uh, commencing July 2022 uh, to June uh, 2023. And for more information, I'll start up to the next slide. Um, you can contact us on that address there, uh, info at ncia.or.ke. You can visit us uh, in our ADR facility at the Cooperative Bank House, uh, seventh floor, or you can call us on that number, 0771-293-055, and um, much more on this information at our website, www.ncia.or.ke. Now, I might also want to mention that for those who have the qualification or acquire this qualification, we are continuously enrolling uh, members to our mediation panel, our arbitration panel, and as and when cases then arise, uh, we have you have visibility 
uh, we, we, we consider the qualifications one has uh, when disputes are referred to us, um, whether for mediation or for arbitration. So although by law, arbitration is not ordinarily used for labor disputes, but we do have contracts where parties have agreed by their own choice to refer cases to arbitration, and we have been uh, appointing arbitrators and awards issued. Uh, and in terms of the success rate, we have not seen any uh, any one of the awards challenged in court. Uh, we presume that parties, after they have been given the awards, have been uh, willing to honor uh, the awards of arbitrators. Thank you so much for sharing that, Rollins. And the one question for um, Jacqueline, as we close now and get a vote of thanks from many of the participants, and then I hand it over to uh, Irene Kamasha for closure. Uh, let me see the question that I have for Jacqueline. Uh, which was, um, are there labor issues that are specifically a prerogative of the court, meaning ADR mm -hmm. cannot be explored? Jacqueline, that is for you as we close. Okay, um, there is no matter, not only in uh, labor or employment, that excludes uh, ADR uh, and can be said to be within the confines of the court. In fact, the Industrial Court uh, Act specifically provides that Alternative dispute resolution is applicable before the parties uh, go to get a resolution from uh, the court. However, there are instances where the most appropriate uh, dispute resolution mechanism is litigation. And usually we default to issues where we do need a precedent um, for future reference. So we are trying to create a, a policy because there's nothing provi provided for in in law, in statute, and uh, even what is uh, within the you know policy realm is vague, and you want a clear cut uh, you know uh, decision on which to you know to to fall back and say the you know the courts have already ruled on this issue and this is what they've said. So if you require a precedent, if it's a constitutional issue, it is usually best to leave that for a decision by the court. Otherwise, ADR is applicable in any conceivable um, situation. From the one where you're walking into the morning and uh, there's a, a small tiff between the staff, the one that has proceeded to the labor officers, and uh, one that is before the industrial court, or even the, um, you know, on appeal to the court of appeal. Um, the Court of Appeal doesn't have any real framework for ADR, but they do record consents if you engage ADR and come to them and say, you know, the parties have agreed, so they will record a consent. So there's nothing that is ex specifically excluded um, from uh, ADR. However, as a matter of policy also, anything I had mentioned about uh, wrongful acts, violence and crime, you know, there are those matters that, uh, re that relate to sexual harassment or exploitation. Those ones, I would, as a matter of policy, not encourage anybody to do ADR in them. And even if a matter becomes, or you become aware that there's that angle, kindly refer it to the appropriate authorities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jacqueline Ohenya. Um, anybody from the group who would like to give a vote of thanks? Two minutes only before I hand it over to Irene for closure. Anybody from any Hello. participants? Hello. Yes, we Hello. Yes, uh, Jen, how are you? Away? Very fine, we <laughs> Yes, please. Uh, actually, um, I must say, I've been um, so much been given a lot of knowledge, and I uh, really want to appreciate. So first, uh, I want to thank God, of course, for giving us such an opportunity. It's not obvious that uh, we wake up and uh, get to such a day healthy and kicking. Secondly, I also want to take this opportunity to thank the uh, presenters for the good work. All of them have been perfect and to the point. I'm sure uh, the team has been properly informed. And then uh, thirdly, to thank all the participants for also giving uh, sparing some time to get this knowledge. And we feel that um, this is the way to go. And of course, uh, Jen, for being a very good uh, moderator and uh, making sure that we have a team that has really and properly articulated issues that I know have been of concern to many of us. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much, everyone, and I appreciate. And I want to wish you all a good uh, long weekend. 
and hope that uh, Jen, many more of this, many more of this will be coming. Back to you there, Jen. Thank you very much, Weekly. Uh, Irene, are you in the house? Irene Kamashia? Karibu sana, please uh, close it and promise that we're going to yes, get more of this. Karibu sana, stop to the members as we close. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you, Jane. Thank you so much. And thank you, Weekly, for that vote of thanks. Uh, my apologies, I joined in a bit late. I was coming from a, another meeting where we have officially launched the new CHRP curriculum and the diploma and certificate. I'm sure that communication will be coming to members. So allow me to really appreciate our partners, uh, the Nairobi Center for International Arbitration. Thank you so much, Mr. Lawrence. And indeed, it is just the beginning of very many more to come. So thank you to all our speakers, Jackie, Gladys, and Lawrence for sharing the knowledge. Thank you to members. We got to over 410. So we do not take it for granted that, um, you know, in the course of your day, you took the time to just learn. That shows that this is important for you. And so we will share the content. We will share the slides. It is a recording that is live on our YouTube channel. If you search HRM Kenya, you can you know, uh, listen to it once again and share with your colleagues. And uh, we, we truly appreciate. Thank you, Jane, also for being a great moderator and taking us through the various mm -hmm. sessions. At the Institute, we are really advocating for alternative dispute resolution. We have had several uh, trainings. We have even had a few members certified. And I believe this uh, collaboration with the NCIA we will just strengthen that and uh, we appreciate the wealth of knowledge, knowledge that you have. So we will be partnering a lot more moving forward to bring this to our members. I think I'll leave it at that because we are almost 10 minutes into past our time and wish you a nice lunch break and now uh, uh, a nice uh, long weekend. Thank you. Thank you so much, Irene, and wishing everyone a good um afternoon and lunch uh, we see you next time thank you so much for getting the time back to you. natasha you. members can leave at your own time Thank you.